Hello, everyone, and welcome to this free webinar presented by We Past. My name is Christina Ruiz, and I will be your moderator today. Throughout the webinar, we will stop the presentation to review. There will be six multiple choice review questions, which you will be able to answer in the polls section. Please go ahead and respond to these questions as they come up. You will have about a minute to answer each one. During the webinar, please feel free to use the chat to ask questions and discuss the topic. We will take time after the presentation to answer these. This and other recorded webinars will be available to WePast subscribers. You can register through WePast.com to become a subscriber. For today's webinar, please bear with us as we are experiencing some slight audio difficulties. Today's topic is radio biology, presented by Jerry Siniglio, radiation therapist and lecturer at the NES. RT Radiation Therapy Registry Review on Radiation Biology. Thank you so much for joining us, Jerry. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about um, some various aspects of radiobiology, um, and we'll go through um, a little bit about looking at radiation's effects individually as a single fraction as well as in a multi-fractional setting as in radiation therapy. Um, so we'll be covering quite a wide range of topics as we go through here. So um, well, without further ado, we'll get started here on this talk on radiobiology review. And the best place to start is really with the basics of biological interactions. Um, as, as we all know here, we are dealing with the transfer of energy from our radiation beams to living cells. Um, and really the effects that we'll talk about biologically seen, um, have to do with how cells, tissues, and organs respond to uh, that energy transfer. And really radiobiology is, is the study, kind of the sequence of events that we see as energy is transferred to these cells, so do the cells compensate? Um, and if not, what type of damage might be seen over time? So basic interactions here, um, radiation generally interacts by one of two means here, through some type of direct action, um, or more likely in our case through the indirect method, which we'll talk um, quite a bit about. Direct action um, tends to be an ionization event that happens in one of the critical kind of macromolecules, and essentially we'll be looking at the DNA and, and, and also the plasma membrane. Um, this is generally the interaction that is seen with particular radiation, such as protons, neutrons, alpha particles, and not so much with electromagnetic radiations. The indirect action, however, is the one that um, we see in the vast majority of cases, and this is the one that's associated with x-rays and gamma rays, the things that we work most often with. Um, this particular ionization is generally in water, which is the medium in which the cells are suspended. It doesn't mean that the indirect action doesn't happen in other parts of the cell, but because of the sheer amount of water that humans are grow around 80%, the probability is greatest to see indirect action actually in the water molecule. So one of the byproducts of this interaction, and really uh, one of the, the main things to know about the types of damage that we do is this process of creating free radicals from the ionization of water itself. Um, free radicals, by definition, are, are, are atoms that have a single unpaired electron um, in the outer shell. This really renders them chemically unstable. Um, the valence shell is only allowed to have eight electrons in it, and in a free radical there's only one. So it does allow them to combine chemically with other parts of the cell, including the DNA. Um, because the free radicals also have an unpaired electron in the valence shell, that gives them some kind of high degree of reactivity. Um, in a neutral atom, electrons spin clockwise and counterclockwise, and their magnetic fields cancel each other out. However, in a free radical, we see this unpaired electron in the valence shell. So we have, again, seven openings as well as an unpaired electron, which gives them a high degree of reactivity and allows these free radicals really to move from the water and the cytoplasm into the nucleus, where they can attach to the DNA and do some damage to the DNA through that process. 
Um, so what we're looking at here, this process of the absorption of x-rays and the creation of free radicals is called the hydrolysis of water. Um, and this is really what the indirect method is, this interaction of water creation and free radicals. Now, one thing to look at is really um, when we're talking about X-rays transferring energy is, is how much energy is transferred and is there some way to compare different types of radiations. Um, so we'll look at linear, linear energy transfer and all that. Um, linear, linear energy transfer is really defined as the rate at which energy is deposited as charged particles travel through water. Now, of course, we're working with X-rays which have no charge and no mass. So we would expect them to have very low amounts of linear energy transfer from when we're working with electrons and much larger particles such as protons and neutrons that they would have much higher amounts of energy transfer. So LET really is a function of mass and charge. As either one of those goes up, we would expect to see a corresponding increase in the amount of energy transferred over any given distance. X-rays and gamma rays, as we said, having no mass and no charge are considered low LET radiations, okay? And they are said to be sparsely ionized because they deposit kind of haphazardly as they move through tissue and randomly as well. X-rays and gamma rays, however, do through the process of ionization produce fat constant effect through photoelectric effect. Um, and this, the these particles, of course, have mass and charge, and they contribute to dose. So that is why X-rays do have low LET and not no LET, um, as one might think, because they have no mass and charge. Particular radiations that are used in the fields of protons, neutrons, and alpha particles are considered very high, densely ionizing radiation because of their associated masses and charges that contribute to. Now, well, one thing to think about is the, how equal doses of different types of radiations, you know, well, do they produce the same type of biological responses? And of course, they don't. Um, when we treat with protons or neutrons, um, we would expect to see a lot of linear energy transfer and a lot of radiobiological effect here. So, in all x-rays, will produce considerably less damage than 100 centigrade of neutrons, for example. And this is really just a matter of how dose is distributed here. The neutron dose is given off in a very short track, all 100 centigrade. The 100 centigrade of x-rays is, is given off over a very long amount of track here. So, it's a much lower LET. He really is just an, a, a way to try to compare and attempt to compare different types of radiation possible damage that one might see. So LET and RBE kind of help us look at different types of radiations and what type of biological effect they may have considering equal doses. And it's really, again, it comes down to the track over which the doses are deposited here and the energy is deposited in the tissue. Radiation in cellular targets, um, when we think about targets kind of in the cells, um, we have to look at the cell kind of in its larger system. And many parts of the cell, mostly the organelles here, are duplicated throughout the cell. So as radiation interacts, damage to one or more of the different organelles, especially the ones that are produced in duplicate here, may not in fact be lethal to the cell at all. Um, so biology, I mean, the main consideration is the cell membrane and the DNA. So, of course, they're only present in the amounts that are necessary for the cell. Um, damage to either of those structures can be critical for its cell's ability to survive. This, in general, is considered to be much more sensitive than the cytoplasm, and radiation effects on the DNA tend to be of the greatest concern because this is damage that is heritable and may be transferred on to the daughter cell. Um, there are basically two general points to think about when we look at radiation damages. One, that most of the damage to the DNA can be and is repaired by the cell um, during the S phase in particular. And not all types of DNA damage are equal in terms of kind of their biological significance. Now, in a quick look at um, and, and some of the potential damage that we can see with radiation. Um, on the upper right, you see a double strand break, you know, in the sugar phosphate backbone. Here, the DNA chain can become unraveled, all right? And this could have a significant impact, obviously, on the daughter cells um, during mitosis. 
Underneath that, base changes are, are common to radiation damage. And again, any type of base change is a mutation. And mutations also can have potential outcomes on the daughter cells as well. Below that, though, you see a single strand break in one of the sugar phosphate backbones. And that by itself actually is very easily repaired during the S phase. Um, and on the left hand side, you see an interstrand cross link, again from free radical damage. This is covalent bonding. Um, kind of diagonally in the DNA chain. And again, during the S phase when the DNA unzips, this could lead to potential damage as well. Um, but we have to really remember that with X radiation, a lot of damage is repaired by human cells. And we start to look at a bigger level. Um, you know, the DNA, of course, sits in the genes, genes sit on the chromosomes, chromosomes are very large. Um, these types of radiation effects are actually quite observable under the light microscope. We see these types of effects, you know, visually. Um, they can occur both in the body cells, the somatic cells, as well as the germ cells. And both types of this damage can be transmitted during mitosis and meiosis and have, again, impact on the daughter cells. Equally as serious as DNA damage, um, chromosomal damage, you know, just some, some kind of, you know, um, some of the oddities that can happen that you would see with X radiation are dicentric fragments, you know, damage to the chromosome where the chromosomes kind of clump together and form some very strange characteristics such as ring chromosomes and acentric fragments. Really with the end result being, you know, kind of on the bottom of that slide is showing you that during mitosis, you know, both daughter cells inherit variable amounts of DNA. Um, and this can have, again, very drastic outcomes for the survival of the daughter cells. So taking a look at question number one here, um, sparsely ionizing radiation such as X-rays and gamma rays have um, high LET and low RBE, high LET and high RBE, low LET and high RBE, or low LET and low RBE. All right, and the answer here is low LET and low RBE. So they deposit their energy sparsely over long distances. So they don't have a high amount of energy transfer. And comparatively speaking, um, X-rays have the lowest relative biological effect compared to the larger charged particles that have high mass as well. So looking at cellular response to radiation, um, it's really best looked at through cell survival curves. And, and what we'll talk about uh, is really the definitions of what each part of the curve represent um, and their kind of what the shape of a mammalian curve really is. Um, we are, these are complex curves compared to simple bacteria. And mammal cells tend to have some ability to repair x-ray damage, as we said. And that kind of relates to the shape of this curve. It's not a straight line, it has a little shoulder there. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the definitions and what they mean as far as cell survival curves go. Four parameters that are used to describe these complex mammal curves. And the first one being kind of the N, or extrapolation number, which came from that earlier curve there. And this particular um, definition really is related to how many targets really need to be um, damaged in order to cause cell death. It's extrapolated from the terminal portion of the curve, and then it's extrapolated back up to the y-axis, somewhere above one. Um, and that generally represents a theoretical number of the number of targets that must be hit um, in a cell in order for it to be damaged. For human cells, that number tends to be between 2 and 10, meaning that really radiation damage has to accumulate um, in order for the cell to die. Next is the DQ, or also called the quasi-threshold dose. And this is an important one as it kind of represents the width of the shoulder, that kind of arcing curve there at the beginning of the cell survival curve. The shoulder is really a measure of the ability of a cell to repair damage. 
cell populations that have larger shoulders um, tend to repair damage better than cell populations that have narrower shoulders. And the width of the shoulder is generally related to how quickly cells move through the cell cycle. They move very quickly, they have narrow shoulders, they don't have time to repair the damage. Cells that move through slower um, have more time to repair X damage and much will have a larger shoulder. All right, so the larger the shoulder, the greater the repair capacity. And those first two parameters really kind of are related to the shoulder of the curve itself. D0, which is that final terminal slope, that straight line portion at the very end where increasing dose gets you equal increase in cell um, is really kind of um, by looking at the slope of that straight line and then taking the reciprocal of it. So if you look at the slope of the line, take the reciprocal of it, that gives you your D sub zero dose. And it's defined as a dose that kills all but 37% of the population. And no matter what cell population you look at, if you look at their cell survival curves and you take the inverse of the slope, you end up with a dose that always does this always kills all but 37% of the cell population. And because it always represents the same thing, it really can be compare cell populations to other cell populations and get their D sub zero doses, right? This is really an expression of radiosensitivity, right? So lower D sub zero doses mean that lower amounts of radiation cause 63% cell kill or 37% cell survival, or something with a higher D sub zero dose Right, requires more dose to kill exactly the same amount. So we can compare radio sensitivity using the sub-zero doses that we get from this terminal portion of the curve. Very beginning of the curve, where the curve starts at the y-axis, we have one last kind of descriptor here, and it's called 1D sub-zero. Um, it's a small kind of initial exponential region falling right before the shoulder. So it starts at the y-axis, a very short region that's straight, then the curve where we see repair, and then the final portion. And because x-radiation interactions are completely random, and there's just some, some general probabilities associated here, this is really random single hit killing. So even at very low doses, even though one would expect those to have to really escalate in order for cells to die, there is kind of out of share kind of some randomness in which one interaction is all that's required to kill the cell. It's just having to be in the right place in the, the DNA. Um, and that is represented again at the very beginning of the curve um, by again random single hit, hit kill, even though the end number just tends to be higher than that. All right, so it's just a probability part of the curve. And there they are kind of shown on the graph itself zero where the Beginning, then we have our kind of shouldered region, DQ, and then a terminal portion, D0 there, and then extrapolating this dotted line goes back up to give us the kind of target number. And um, the cell survival curves are, are, are kind of a nice visual way to um, compare different types of cell populations and their ability, you know, to handle, repair, um, X radiation damage um, by simply kind of looking at the graphs, the steepness of the graph. Width of the shoulder itself. We can make some good comparisons there. Right, it shows, I mean, if you look at a lot of studies, um, you know, sparsely ionizing radiation, such as x ray, we said are often repaired, it's seen both in normal tissues and unfortunately in malignant tumors as well. Um, there are really two types to look at sublethal damage repair and potentially lethal damage repair. Um, and suddenly, then looking at taking a large dose of radiation, dividing it up over smaller equal doses. These are called split dose studies. Um, they're separated by various intervals of time, generally more than six hours, and then as long as 24 hours in between doses. And what you see is that as you do that, as you take a larger dose and split it into smaller equal fractions, um, the, the amount of cells that survive this tends to increase, right? Because we're giving them time in between these smaller sublethal doses of radiation in order to repair the damage itself. The study, if you look at the two cell survival curves here, we've got the curve kind of one um, on the left-hand side, separated by a certain amount of time, again, greater than six hours, and then the second curve um, happening after that uh, with another dose of radiation. If you look at the curves, they're identical. You know, the two terminal portions are parallel to each other, and the shoulder region is the same. And what that tells us is that 
given that amount of uh, a, a certain amount of time in between these two doses, that cells do repair the damage, sublethal damage, um, and respond as if they had not been irradiated the prior day. All right, and that's kind of what a split dose study shows. If the time period between them is much shorter than the time that's allotted and that's needed for them to repair, the curves would look drastically different. But they don't; they're identical. Potentially lethal damage repair is a little bit different, right? Potentially lethal damage repair has to do with the conditions the cell is placed in post-irradiation exposure. You know, what type of environment is this? You know, so the question is, what would kind of be the result of placing cells post-radiation exposure in suboptimal growth conditions, basically depleting its nutrient supply? Um, and one might expect that uh, cell survival would go down in such conditions not the case here. Um, survival actually increases when cells are placed in suboptimal growth conditions post irradiation exposure. Um, so the reason, you know, the question is, is how come? Well, anything that happens to slow down the cell cycle gives cells more time to repair damage. And because cells are in suboptimal nutrient conditions, they slow down their actual cell cycle times. And as the cell cycle time slows, this gives the, the cells more time to repair damage. Most radiation damage is expressed during mitosis, so if we slow down the cell cycle time in any way, um, that gives cells more time to repair damage. So sublethal damage is related to the dose split up into smaller equal fractions, and potentially lethal damage repair is related to the actual conditions the cell is in after radiation exposure. Right? Again, this permits extra time for DNA repair. All right, so to question two here, in a mammalian cell survival curve, what portion best corresponds to the cell's ability to repair? N, D2, D0, or 1, D0? And looking at the answer here, DQ, which represents the width of the shoulder, best represents the ability of cells to repair damage. And if you think about really what's happening there, as dose increases in that shoulder region, it's in such a range that the cell has the ability to withstand that radiation and repair that damage. So you don't have a straight line. Now, once dose gets high enough, then we get to that terminal straight line portion where you have equal increases in dose representing equal increases in the amount of cell kill. Um, but in the shoulder region, cells are able to stand for the repair radiation. A little bit at kind of um, tissue responses here. We'll start off talking a little bit about um, the laws of Bergeon and Tribendo as they apply to radiation. Um, and early on, they thought the most radiosensitive cells are those that are most immature, um, least specialized, greatest reproductive activity, and the longest mitotic phase, meaning a long life of, of division process. Of course, these refer to any of our stem cell populations where we're rapidly dividing immature cells. Um, we're showing a those that these cells respond to this, that they were the most radiosensitive cells in the body. Later, the hypothesis is modified a bit more, and here, um, Ansel and Wittenberger describe um, their modification. They stated really that inherent sensitivity to radiation damage is the same across all cell lines, but that the time of appearance from radiation damage differs amongst different cell types. So every cell has the same ability to repair damage, um, but some are given more time to do that, and they appear more radio resistant. Cells that go through the division process very quickly show their damage during mitosis and don't have time to repair that damage they appear to be more radiosensitive, right? But it's all about the time of cell division. If we slow down those fast dividing cells, they would be a little bit more radio resistant, right? So it's about time here. So they're saying here that inherent sensitivities are the same. It's really the time or the expression of it that is seen to be different. 
Uh, they basically divide um, tissue into two broad categories, acutely responding tissues and late responding tissues, of course, relating to their division time. And this really is a reference to the time that it takes for damage to occur. Uh, to occur. And tissues, um, also called early responding tissues, they tend to manifest radiation energy in the first few weeks to months after the completion of a radiation course. Um, generally, we see this in all the self-renewing tissues, such as bone marrow, the intestinal linings, um, and the testes as well. Um, late re do not express their injury for at least three months or longer, sometimes a year later after radiation. And again, the expression of the damage takes a long time because the cells take a long time to divide. And since most damage is seen during mitosis, we have to wait for that to happen in order to see that. Um, lung and kidney are good examples of late responding tissues or organs. Patients of cell and tissue response. What can we do to change radiosensitivity or radioresistance? Right, well, there are some chemical factors that are probably worth looking at here. Radiation sensitizers um, are chemicals that would enhance any radiation response. Um, Radio protectors on the other that would diminish radiation. Um, a true radio sensitizer, by definition, should increase the total amount of cell kill um, for any given dose of radiation. And right now, the chemical that has the most dramatic effect, especially when we talk about tumor radiobiology, um, has, has to be oxygen. Right, because of the dramatic effect that oxygen has on cell kill, it has its own term called the oxygen. Um, oxygen effective when administered simultaneous, simultaneously with radiation, meaning the oxygen is already taken up in the cell, um, not pre or post radiation exposure, meaning that the oxygen has to be in the cell at the time that the radiation is transferring its energy and producing free radicals. Um, so the theories on uh, how this response works, um, oxygen enhancing the formation of free radicals or drawing existing free radicals into chain reactions, producing more highly damaging radical species. So oxygen tends to enhance the formation of free radicals when it's there. Because of oxygen, many of the chemical changes that occur with any interaction of radiation are reversible. In the presence of oxygen, the process of repair seems to be blocked. So this increases the amount of damage. So cells that have oxygen not only have more free radical production, but we see more damage from a in addition to that, it tends to make the damage permanent, basically fixing the damage um, and making it permanent. So we kind of have these three things going on with oxygen and cells. This becomes very important in tumor radiobiology. Um, as tumors outgrow their vessel supply, they have varying amounts of oxygen tension. The farther they are away from a vessel, the less oxygen, the more hypoxic they become. Um, in the radiation therapy world, it makes those ones more difficult to treat because they're lacking oxygen. So oxygen is a very important factor when we look at radiation therapy, especially in tumor radiobiology itself. Cells that, um, you know, the presence of oxygen and cells that are lacking that, that are farther away from the vessels, tend to be more hypoxic. Um, oxygen has a dramatic effect on the cell survival curve. Um, first, because it's a radiosensitizer making um, cells more, appear more sensitive to radiation. Um, the shoulder is made smaller in the presence of oxygen. Cells have less of an ability to repair damage. Um, also, the exponential region, um, the, the straight line portion, tends to be steeper, resulting in a decreased D sub zero, meaning that you need less radiation to kill the 63% of the cells. Right? So a smaller shoulder, a steeper straight line portion, and we end up, you know, looking at this kind of oxygen, which is really defined as the dose of radiation that produces a biological response in the absence of oxygen, divided by this dose of radiation that produces the same biological response in the presence of oxygen. Um, and oxygen has, um, has has quite a benefit in this case. For million cells, it's said to be between two and three. Um, really, this means that in the presence of oxygen, cell kill seems to be about two and a half times greater um, compared to cells in hypoxic states. And you can see that this could be a real problem with fractionated radiation therapy. There is a way around this, and there is a way that we can reoxygenate cells, 
But if you look at cells that are farther from the vessel than tumors that are hypoxic, they tend to have um, quite a bit of radioprotective state with them because of this hypoxic state that they're in. Um, the oxygen effect is most pronounced for X-rays and gamma rays, um, and it's really not seen with high LET radiation because high LET radiations operate through the direct method. They don't produce free radicals, and oxygen helps enhance free radical production. So this effect is seen much more X and gamma rays versus uh, particulate radiation. There are, um, radiation protectors would be kind of the other category of chemical uh, modifiers here. Um, they need to be present at the time of radiation exposure in order to exert any protective effect. Um, you know, administered right before, right after, no protective effect is seen. They, again, they need to be there at the time of free radical production. One group of chemicals that has been studied are called the sulfide, where WR2721 is one of the main sulfide groups. Um, these groups contain a chemical called cysteine, um, which has been shown to have quite a bit of a radiation protection effect, and basically meaning that we can administer larger doses of radiation, um, you know, without having, having any more difficulty um, in getting the same effect dose is called the dose reduction factor or protection factor. Um, if these cysteine compounds are present during a radiation exposure, almost twice the dose is necessary to produce a given effect, right? So it can have a quite a bit of a protection factor on normal tissues, if we are able to deliver those to the normal tissues and not to a tumor. Um, how they work, you know, they protect by either competing to produce free radicals, or by giving up hydrogen atoms to the ionized molecule with water molecules which seem to neutralize the effects of radiation. I mean, they're really free radical scavengers. Um, so again, that's why they need to be there present at the time of radiation exposure. Most efficient, again, with X and gamma ray production, very negligible effects as far as with high LEP radiation, because once again, they do not produce free radicals. Most of the chemicals for radio protectors don't seem to be in widespread use. Um, they can be very toxic, even in the right amounts. Um, timing is very important. Um, they have to be there, of course, at the exact time that the radiation exposure happens. Um, and they're under investigation for uh, many reasons, both civilian and military, and in therapy and protection. Um, you know, the key with protectors and sensitizing agents is being able to deliver them to the correct tissues. You, know, you don't want healthy tissues taking up radio sensitizers, and of course, we do want the tumor cells to take up radio protectors. As this kind of becomes the holy grail of, of looking for these chemicals that will only go to one tissue versus the other. So, question three aerated cells are how many more times radio sensitive than hypoxic cells? Right, aerated cells tend to be two and a half times more radio sensitive than hypoxic cells. And again, this comes from really the fact that oxygen helps enhance free radical formation. Um, it kind of sets the damage that happens from radiation, fixing it, kind of making it permanent. So after radiation pathology, looking kind of at acute and chronic effects. Um, so now what triggers kind of the sequence of events that leads to visible ch changes or the damage that we see? erythema of the skin, alopecia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, what triggers these types of events? Basically, we're looking at cellular loss of cells from the organ. That's the initial event that leads to physical changes. So destruction from radiation and cell death in the tissues themselves leads to what we first see. And based on that, we can basically categorize um, tissues into really two broad categories. Those that are acute effects or chronic and late effects, all right? So this is what we visually see as opposed to acute and late responding tissues which are related to the time in which we see the effects. 
terms here really describe what is observed as opposed to what the three days time for the other ones. Acute changes. These are kind of initial responses that are seen certainly in the radiation therapy world. Um, they can include any of the following things such as inflammation, edema, hemorrhage, or denudation of the coastal surfaces, which really is flattening um, of the mucosal surface. Some of the chronic chain, primary and secondary ones, can, uh, these are ones that are going to kind of progress over time, are things such as fibrosis, atrophies, ulcerations, strictures, gnosis, obstructions. These types of are considered to be chronic changes, seen a little bit um, more so after uh, higher doses of radiation. Both types of tissues acute and late responding tissues have both acute and late effects, early effects and effects that happen a little bit longer after. So acute effects are really a direct result of depletion of the parenchymal cells or the functional cells of the organ or tissue. So as dose builds up and these cells start to die off, we start to see acute effects as a relationship really to directly killing cells in the tissues or organs themselves. Now when they're expressed are going to vary um, drastically with time based on how quickly the tissues turn over. Again, the thing to remember is that most of these responses are seen during mitosis and meiosis, so we have to wait for those things to happen, right? So there's gonna be widely varying time frames as to when we see acute effects. Chronic effects, however, or late effects, differ in how they develop, right? And there's two different chronic effects or long-term effects. Basically, as a consequence of irreversible and progressive early acute changes as they accumulate. And it's due to the depletion of non parenchymal cells, the non functional cells, but we're talking about here the support cells, stroma and vascular components associated with the tissue itself, destruction in that area. Chronic effects resulting from irreversible progressive acute changes are termed secondary chronic effects. Whereas chronic effects resulting from kind of damage to the support network, these non parenchymal cells, are termed primary or chronic effects. The thing to note about them is generally with secondary and primary chronic effects is that they're irreversible and most likely very progressive over time. Right? So they are things that we certainly would want to avoid. Now, healing of tissues. Um, always possible with X and gamma radiation, although not in every particular case. Healing comes about from generally two main forms. One is regeneration, um, replacement of the damaged cells in the organ by the same cell type, so stem cells repopulate after a dose of radiation, or repair, which is an, a type of healing as well. This is replacement of damaged cells in the organ by a different cell type. Okay, so this is um, fibrous tissue. That is a form of healing, but it's by a different cell type, and that really doesn't contribute to the tissue or organ's ability to function, um, but it is a healing of sorts. Repair processes, as we said, do not contribute to the organ's ability to function, although it is a healing event. Healing is not always a certain event. I mean, if doses escalate to the point where they're above a tissue's ability to repair, you can end up with necrosis, which is death of a tissue or organ. The type of healing that's going to occur is really a function of dose and the specific organ or radiation. Right? Lower doses allow for better healing. Um, in the tissue that have stem cell compartments associated with them, if there are some operating stem cells after the dose of radiation, will regenerate. Um, and that is, again, another part of the healing. One very important aspect, of course, when we're talking about this is the volume effect. How much of the organ has been exposed to radiation? Um, the TD55 doses are really based on the volume of the organ radiated, which TD55 itself is defined as a tolerance dose of a specific organ and tissue that causes a 5% complication rate in five years. But certainly the smaller the volume, the higher the tolerance dose. And in today's day and age of radiation therapy with IMRT, um, volumes are getting very small, which is allowing for us to have escalating doses um, associated with these. And still, having healthy tissues have the ability to repair um, this damage over time. So question four. Which of the following is not considered to be a chronic effect of radiation?
right, so hemorrhaging is not to be a chronic effect. This is, again, one that we would look at as being an acute effect of radiation. Stricture, fibrosis, and obstructions are progressive um, and tend to be irreversible after a course of radiation. So they would be chronic. Late effects of radiation. So looking kind of at late effects, these are things that tend to manifest after very long periods of time after radiation. So late effects can really remain dormant for many years, um, and in fact, really may not even be seen in the individual who is radiated, especially if we pass these genetic changes on um, through meiosis, through the reproductive cells, onto our offspring. Um, so they may be seen in our children or our children's children. So it can be quite some time before they exhibit themselves. So they may show up in succeeding generations. Late effects really can of individuals. People who have survived acute high doses of radiation, some radiation accidents, um, we've seen this in. Exposure to a single low dose, very interesting here. You know, just a single x-ray at some point can really, you can see late effects um, down the road. And chronic low dose exposure. So these are patients who receive radiologic or nuclear medicine procedures, and of course that really puts us occupational exposed people um, in this category as well, especially people who work in radiology um, who do tend to build up kind of low dose exposure over long working careers. These are all groups really that need to be looked at for um, late effects. effects. So it can be two broad categories. Um, the first is non-stochastic or deterministic effects, um, and these are defined as effects that have threshold doses associated with them. Um, threshold doses are things that if we stay below them, we do not see the effect, but if we rise above the threshold dose, not only do we see the effect, but the severity of the effect is also dose-related. Um, Radiation-induced cataracts are the example most often used for these. Um, and again, a threshold dose is one that below a certain dose, no effect would be seen. Once reached, the effect starts and severity will escalate as the dose rises. Second category is stochastic effects, um, and these don't exhibit a threshold, meaning that any dose of radiation, no matter how small, carries a probability, even though it's very small, of inducing the effect. This is why no extra dose um, is good. You really have to be careful about how much radiation is given. Um, repeat exposures um, are all problematic in this way because we move along this kind of curve, this probability curve of inducing a stochastic effect with each additional x-ray photon given. Again, albeit as small as it might be. So increasing the dose and you increase the probability of these effects. However, the severity is, is not something that increases with this. Right? It's just the probability of the effect that will happen. Right? Severity is not. And the, and the big one that we want to really look at would be carcinogenesis. Cancer induction is an example, right? You know, a, a cancer that has been induced by a prior radiation exposure. And again, a single X-ray photon really could be the, the beginning of this, right? Producing some kind of base damage in the DNA, um, resulting in the formation of cancer. So, again, every X-ray really um, we have to look at the, the small probabilities that we can increase these types of Effects. Somatic effects is a somatic effect that happens in the body there. Um, there's a single most important late um, effect of radiation, particularly after low doses, um, such as those received by occupationally exposed personnel or patients undergoing diagnostic tests. Um, radiation certainly has a very long and storied history in relationship to you know, increasing incidence of many different types of malignancies in humans. Um, the thing here is, is, you know, why is it that lower doses tend to be the things that we worry about here? And the thing is, is the cells have to survive in order to mutate into some type of cancer down the road. So high doses that kill a lot of cells, if the cell dies, of course, there's no chance that it will turn into um, a tumor down the road or a cancer. Um, so the, again, low dose radiation exposure where the cell, you know, survives that dose of radiation are the ones that we really need. The implicated malignancies kind of include things such as leukemias, skin carcinomas, osteosarcomas, lung, thyroid, and breast cancers really have um, a pretty direct link to prior radiation exposure at some point. Induced cancer, I mean, 
it's well known that the structural changes in chromosomes, DNA, and genes are really kind of uh, these resulting mutations are a known effector brain. And although the probability of mutation in one or a few cells of resulting in one is probably on the smaller side, um, the process is probably a much more complex one than just looking at um, chromosomal and DNA data. The current aviation, through kind of this moving translocation of genetic material, allows oncogenes, which are normally unexpressed, to become expressed, ultimately causing cancer. And these, uh, we look at these oncogenes, and we're talking about genes that really regulate cell growth. Um, you know, and if, if the damage is seen in those, and that that kind of is turned off, then cells will reproduce out of control, ultimately forming cancer. Genes to expression is speculatively linked to the conversion of normal cells to cancer cells themselves. So there's probably a combination of many factors that play a role in inducing cancer. Um, things like environmental and health factors are, are known to increase risk. So things that we may be exposed to in the environment, chemicals, um, and our own health factors, you know, our own immune response, in addition to radiation damage, these all may work together to have to, to increase the chances of cancer induction. So radiation really becomes one of many um, insults and probably not the sole factor in the etiology of cancer. And I think we know that now that it's much more complex. Genetic effects. So what's the impact of radiation exposure on future generations? Um, naturally occurring changes we see in DNA and genes are termed spontaneous mutations. These are ones that happen in nature um, without looking at radiation um, as one of the effects here. These changes, these spontaneous muta mutation changes that occur naturally are both permittable, permanent and heritable. So these are things that will be passed along um, during my there's a certain number of spontaneous mutations that arise in each generation. These are termed the mutation frequency, which is the number of mutations that we see. Frequency of spontaneous mutations can be altered by factors. Um, things such as viruses, epstein bar virus, these things can increase the number of mutations. Um, chemicals that we see out in the environment, things that we work with, such as asphalt and pitch, um, things that are used in roofing, um, and radiation are all mutagens. These are things that have the ability to change the base pairs, the DNA base pairs, um, which can ultimately lead again to genetic changes and mutations that we can pass on. So viruses, chemicals, and radiation tend to be things that are all mutagens. What does radiation do here? Well, radiation simply increases the incidence of the same types of mutations that occur spontaneously. So in a population that sees larger amounts of radiation, such as in the West here where diagnostic imaging is very large, where radiation therapy is used extensively, populations would see an increase kind of in the amount of spontaneous mutations compared to populations that don't use as much radiation. So we really just increase the incidence of the same types of mutations that occur spontaneously. It doesn't produce any new or unique mutation changes. Um, so we can't look back on a change and go, oh, that it was definitively caused by a prior radiation exposure because there's nothing unique about the mutation. We just increase the normal incidence, right? And that incidence of radiation-induced mutations seems to follow a linear relationship with dose. So we're looking at kind of um, escalation in dose causes an inch, a linear increase in the number of mutations seen in the population. So again, you know, this is something where as dose escalates, um, not only do the probability of stochastic effects um, increase, but also we see kind of a linear rise in the total number of mutations in the population of people as dose escalates as well. The incidence of mutations is most likely dose rate dependent in humans. As are most things, dose rate is, I mean, we are exposed um, daily 
to background radiation, given over long periods of time at low dose, and we seem to respond very well to that. Um, however, when you give a, a dose of radiation very quickly, um, we tend to see, again, both mutation um, as it relates to the dose rate itself. So the incidence of mutation is most likely dose rate dependent in humans, how quickly we receive the dose of radiation. Now, um, the, the big section here kind of um, as we move towards the end here really looks at kind of the fractionation uh, of, of radiation. Um, therapeutic radiobiology looks at kind of radiation therapy and taking very large doses of radiation, which might be lethal given all at once, um, and dividing these doses up over various time periods, um, you know, four, five, six weeks worth of radiation. And, and how do cells um, handle that, that, that fractionated effect? What are some of the benefits of fractionating radiation therapy, as long with some of them, what are some of the things we have to overcome when we want to fractionate radiation? Um, so we'll look at kind of therapeutic radiobiology here. So in full of radiotherapy, a very high dose of radiation, which should kill or sterilize the tumor cells with with minimal damage to the surrounding normal tissues. I mean, the, the goal here is really to leave behind some healthy tissue that can repopulate afterwards, um, while still giving enough radiation to control or kill the tumor cells. The result being hopefully the complete eradication of the tumor um, with sufficient normal tissues remaining to ensure long-term viability and functioning. Like, we do not want to be Cause, you know, the radiation given all at once or in the very high doses or when we look for very thorough therapy, you know, sometimes the treatment was worse than the disease itself. So, you know, the doses that we see that we give today now allow for some viability and functioning of normal tissues. Um, again, hopefully resulting in the ratification of the tumor itself. Treatment with radiation absolutely can cure tumors. Um, there are there are curative doses associated with all tumor types. The question, of course, becomes, can the normal tissues um, handle those high doses of radiation? Um, and that really becomes you know, the goal of looking at you know, dosimetry, different types of LET radiations. You know, what can we do to improve um, you know, cure rates and at the same time leave behind a really viable, healthy, and functioning normal tissues? Okay, so some of the goals here. Although we certainly know we can cure a tumor with a high enough dose of radiation, um, to not um, you know, go beyond the tolerance of the surrounding normal healthy tissues. Right? So the amount of radiation used to treat um, specific malignant tumors is really limited by the tolerance of the surrounding normal tissue. Not, we don't necessarily look at the tumor curative dose itself because that may be beyond what the healthy tissues can um, handle. So, the amount of radiation that we use in radiation therapy in order to treat these tumors is really kind of limited by the tolerance of the surrounding normal tissues um, and how much radiation they are able to handle. This kind of look at the healthy tissue doses and tumor curative doses is governed by something called the therapeutic ratio. The therapeutic ratio is described as the ratio between a dose of radiation that is able to kill the tumor and the tolerance of the um, tolerance dose of the surrounding and the normal healthy tissues themselves. The difference between those kind of two doses um, in these two situations can determine treatment outcomes. So they're really important to look at. So if we look at the column, the following slide here, the image of the following slide. Uh, we have three, three graphs here. Um, on the y-axis, we have percent tumor control, and then we have dose following along on the x-axis itself. So the top-hand graph really shows the most favorable conditions here for radiation. Tumor control happens at much lower doses than tissue damage. So there's some distance between the tumor control curve and the tissue damage curve. And that is really the most favorable um, scenario that, that one can have, where you can control tumors um, with much lower doses. 
On the bottom one, the most unfavorable conditions are, of course, when the tissue damage curve is, you know, much closer to the y-axis than the tumor control curve. And here, I mean, that could be a contraindication for radiation, um, at least initially, maybe a form of chemo or surgery in order to move these, you know, or some type of biologic. But in this case, their radiation doses um, tend to damage the tissue so long before we get tumor control. Now, the center graph, though, really kind of Tells, tells a tale of radiation therapy, therapy where tumor control curve and the tissue damage curve kind of like very, very close to, right? And and so as dose escalates, yes, you're getting tumor control, but you're also getting a corresponding amount of tissue damage. And of course, this is the, the, the scenario that plays out most often as opposed to the upper favorable and the bottom more unfavorable uh, curves there. Um, so tell me one more time, in the middle curve there, you know, what are the things that we can do to try to open up these two curves so that we can get better tumor control versus tissue damage? Again, we can look at things like IMRT, combinations of X-gam, um, X-ray um, treatments with chemotherapeutic agents, um, the combinations of different LAT radiations, proton therapy along with um, X-radiation therapy. You know, anything that we can do to take advantage of kind of the small difference in dose between tumor control and tissue damage is kind of what we need um, in order to control tumors. The role of oxygen in tumor growth. Um, as we talked about earlier with oxygen being a radiation sensitizing agent, um, oxygen plays a really huge role in both tumor growth and really in, in tumor curability um, and our ability with fractionated radiation um, take care of hypoxic cells that we find in the tumors themselves. Um, malignant neoplasms are, are very complex tissues, much more so than at least originally believed. They're very unorganized in their growth patterns, and unlike healthy tissues or normal tissues, uh, tumors tend to outgrow on their vascular supply. That's one thing that happens. So the tumor cells are divided constantly. Um, some of those cells tend to be much farther away from any vessel, um, so they outgrow their vessel supply, find areas of necrosis in the tumor because of this, or um, they can vessels. Um, tumor cells do not stop dividing when they have contact inhibition like most cells do, so they can compress their own vessels. And of course, what happens to cells that are down kind of farther away from um, where that compression is start to become hypoxic and eventually can die as well. So very unorganized and um, so we see their compression or outgrowth of the vessels themselves. What happens though with both scenarios, whether you're outgrowing the, the vessel vessel supplies, you're decreasing the available oxygen. So if the tumor cells remain viable, um, and if they're still alive, but they're not getting there. They become really hypoxic, and we said hypoxia is really um, uh, refers a high amount of radio resistance to these cells, meaning that we would need a higher dose of radiation to take care of these hypoxic cells because um, they're lacking oxygen. Small tumor with a small radius of less than 100 micrometers, which is 10 to the minus 6 liters there did not exhibit necrotic areas, indicating that at least initially when tumors are very tiny, they have sufficient vascular supplies and therefore oxygen supplies. Right? And this, of course, goes right to the role of trying to treat tumors when they're as early on as possible when they're small. Um, these tumors tend to have well oxygenated cells in them, um, and radiation, of course, tends to do much better with oxygen being a sensitizing agent. So the smaller the tumor, um, the better the oxygen supply. So again, under 100 micrometers. As tumors grow, though, um, and their radius tends to exceed the 160 micrometer distance from any vessel, we start to see necrotic areas develop. Right? So we see a viable limb of cells surrounding the vessel, and then the tumor cells continue to divide, and you end up again um, with necrotic cells farther out, and in between the viable cells that are right on the vessel. And the necrotic cells, which are much farther away, you get kind of varying oxygen tension. Um, and we see this by looking at different groups of cells, group one cells being close to the, tum uh, to the vessel, group two and three cells, which are still viable, 
um, but lacking oxygen in that sense tend to be a little more radio, radio resistant. And then as you get farther away than that, then the cells start to die and you see kind of areas of necrosis. So you see these viable rim of cells around each vessel. Continued tumor increase in the size of the necrotic area, oddly enough, but that thickness of the viable rim remains constant. So as the tumors grow and they outgrow these vessels of life, you see larger and larger areas of necrosis in the tumor itself. But that viable rim, rim around each vessel tends to remain constant. Measurements of oxygen tension in the necrotic area were, of course, much lower than in the viable rim, which is why these cells are unable to survive applying insufficient vasculature or oxygen diffusion. Oxygen can't diffuse far enough from the vessels to keep these cells that are, are farther away from the 160 micrometers alive. So we end up with necrosis. So oxygen really becomes kind of the critical factor um, when we look at tumor growth. Right? Oxygen is really a huge part of tumor growth and tumor treatment and curability. Right. What we'll start looking at here is kind of um, what are called the four R's of fractionated radiotherapy. Um, and what we kind of want to look at this as is, you know, what happens to patients um, who are receiving fractionated doses of radiation therapy? So they receive a dose today, they go home, 24 hours goes by, they come back into our department and we treat them again. So what happens at the time of the radiation and then what happens during that 24-hour time frame that they are not being so again, fractionation is really looking at very large doses of radiation given in equal smaller fractions, generally five days a week, um, for their course of radiation. Biologically, if you look at fractionated doses of radiation, they're actually less efficient at causing cell death than our single doses. You know, so why don't, of course, we give one large dose to a patient as opposed to spreading it out? Well, it's the healthy cells. We need healthy cells to survive. Um, so giving one large dose, of course, is not going to work for the healthy cell. So if we are going to fractionate doses of radiation, we have to give larger total doses in order to be efficient at causing cell death in the tumor itself. So we need higher total doses to produce the same degree of biological damage. The longer you, um, the longer you protract the time, the higher the total dose needs to be um, in order to cause the same type of effect. Biological effects of a tumor into a fractionation is dependent on the interplay of these four R's that we are going to look at now in radiobiology. Of course, they are very important when we look at radiation therapy on these fractionated doses. So, first R we're going to look at is distribution. Radiation tends to have two effects on dividing cells. So, again, we're looking at this kind of through the lens of uh, cancer care and radiation therapy and today's dose of radiation. And the first effect it has is kind of, a, it causes cells to delay in the progression of the cell cycle. They tend to be trapped at late G2, um, unable to progress into mitosis. So we give this dose of radiation and we end up having kind of these cells that if they're in mitosis, they continue through. But after that, they tend to want to, they, they tend to slow down their cell cycle times. Um, so we have this division delay delay. And the surviving population tends to be synchronized in resistant phases of the cell cycle. So the patient gets treated today, those that are in M that are dividing, which is the most sensitive phase of the cell cycle, tend to be killed by today's dose of radiation. Of course, tumor cells are rapidly dividing. Many of them are in M phase. But the surviving population of cells after today's dose of radiation tends to be in the more resistant phases of the cell cycle. Right? And the cells are no longer progressing into M. So the surviving population tends to be synchronized in the resistant phase of the cell cycle. The most resistant phase being the S phase. Um, this occurs because cells in the more sensitive M and G2 phases were killed during today's dose of radiation. So, so what's happening here? Well, the, today's dose of radiation, there's a five-fold or five times difference in survival after a dose of two gray. So a lot of us are giving 180 centigrade a day, 200 centigrade a day, 250 centigrade a day, um, kind of in that range between the most resistant phase and the most sensitive phase. That means five times as many cells are killed in M and G2 compared to S, S being the most resistant phase, 
with today's dose of radiation. So we tend to kill the more divided cells, right? Those that are rapidly dividing, those that are slower in division, that are kind of um, locked in the S phase during division delay, tend to be more resistant, and those ones are the ones that are left behind. One would expect, at least, the net effect of fractionation to be a resistant population of cells. The question is, is it? You know, after today's treatment, do we end up with a more resistant population of cells? And the answer to that is, um, and this is where, again, the, the 24 hour time frame between treatments becomes critical. In most cases, um, the natural progression of the population of cells is to rapidly desynchronize. So we treat today, we've left behind this what looks like a more resistant population of cells because we've killed all those that are in M. But during the 24 hours that the patient is home, we see this rapid desynchronization of the cell cycle so that by the time the patient returns tomorrow, um, they are now spread out again to the cell cycle. So the net effect is actually a sensitization of the surviving population because there are fewer surviving cells. We killed some today than when we started, and those that were left redistribute themselves into more sensitive phases of the cell cycle given the 24-hour time frame. And the 24-hour time frame is an important one. The majority, though, of, of this redistribution and all of these R's happens after the first six hours. So for BID treatments, that's why six hours is very important. It does tend to kind of level off the effects over the 24 hours, but you don't want to treat less than the six-hour time frame between the two doses of radiation because we need these R's to all happen. And this is, again, looking at the first one, redistribution into the more sensitive phases of the cell cycle itself. Fusion occurs in the tumor cells themselves um, and in the rapidly proliferating normal tissues, such as the skin, the intestine, the esophagus, anywhere where we have dividing cells. Of course, redistribution has to do with the cell cycle itself, so only those cells moving through the cell cycle will exhibit this first star, as opposed to non dividing cells. In a fractionated schedule, then redistribution should result in increased cell kill in tumors, which is a good thing, and in acutely responding normal tissues, which is not such a good thing, but should have no effect on late responding normal tissues. And the reason why is because we give a sublethal dose each day. So the late responding tissues should be okay here, should have no effect on them because they're not moving through the cell cycle. Because the cells in those tissues, of course, divide so much more slowly compared to tumors and rapidly proliferating normal tissues. The second um, R for us is reoxygenation. And this one really becomes um, uh, really the most important of the R's as far as tumor control goes. Um, hypoxic cells are really have almost three times the more resistance than their oxygenated cell, um, um, the oxygenated cells that are closest to the vessel. So these hypoxic cells, these guys that are still viable, um, they just slow down their division times and they're lacking oxygen because they're farther away from the vessel, really have a high degree kind of a radial resistance. So oxygen plays kind of a key role in the ability of radiation to cure tumors. We have to somehow get these cells oxygen. Um, hypoxia really confers an oppressive measure of protection against x-rays. And also many chemotherapeutic agents, at least those such as leomycin for which free radicals are involved. Now, oxygen being a synthesized agent incre increases free radical um, production, which increases cell kill, and some chemotherapeutic agents also rely on free radical production. So hypoxic cells can not only be um, radio-resistant, but may um, you know, have some protective measures against some chemotherapeutic agents. So getting oxygen out to these cells is very important. The dose of x-rays kills a greater proportion of air rated than hypoxic cells because it's more sensitive. So immediately most of the cells in the tumor are hypoxic. We have killed all the air rated cells, those cells that are closest to the vessel. So these four R's are all going on at the same time. So the first R is happening while this R is happening as well. So immediately after radiation, kill those that are in the M phase from the first R, and this particular R kills those group one cells, those that are directly surrounding the vessels in the tumor that are most well aerated, okay? So we are again left, be, we were kind of left with that scenario where after today's treatment, we've left a tumor behind that's mostly hypoxic. Um, but given time, 
again, that 24 hours or at a minimum of six hours, um, the free radiation pattern tends to return because of reoxygenation. Um, the process of reoxygenation is hugely important um, and has really um, important implications in practical radiotherapy and our ability to cure tumors. So if human tumors do in fact reoxygenate as rapidly and efficiently as most of the animal tumors studied, then we can kind of make some conclusions here with this. Right, simply by using multi-fractionated um, radiation therapy over a long period of time may be all that's required to kind of deal effectively with any hypoxic cells that are in the human tumor themselves. Uh, the mechanism has many components associated with it, but this is kind of the most important thing. As the tumor shrinks in size, surviving cells that were previously beyond the range of oxygen diffusion find themselves closer the blood supply and reoxygenate themselves and thus becoming more sensitive. So today's dose of radiation kills those group one cells, those closest to the vessel. Now over the 24 hour time frame of the patient's home, oxygen now can diffuse out and nutrients can diffuse out into groups two and three. Now those groups were previously hypoxic but now become oxygenated. So each time we fractionate the dose of radiation, we're allowing um, the, the oxygen to diffuse out to these tumor cells that tend to be much more resistant um, to the effects of radiation. So by fractioning, we allow the tumor to become more sensitive to the effects of radiation. Um, it's thought really without this particular R that we wouldn't really be able to cure any tumors whatsoever. Um, because again, we would need three times the total doses that were given to kill these hypoxic cells. And of course, that would be too much of a dose for healthy tissues to be able to repair radiation. Damage. So this reoxygenation effect is a very important one for radiotherapy. This is the RS that selectively increases tumor cell death. Um, the reason why is because in the healthy tissue compartments, all the cells are within um, the 100 micrometer range of a vessel at all times. So normal oxygen saturation tension in, in normal cells tends to be close to 100%. Only in tumors that outgrow their vessel supply do you see hypoxia. So this particular R is really selected for increasing tumor cell care itself. As we know, um, potentially fail conventional schedules. You know, and, and this is probably due to inadequate reoxygenation between fractions. Probably not all patients reoxygenate on a 24-hour schedule. Some may take longer than that. And those that um, fail the normal conventional schedule that we see that so many patients doing well on is probably because of inadequate reoxygenation between doses of radiation itself. Regeneration is the third R, but so keeping in mind that all of these work together, um, both tumor cells and normal tissue cells respond to depopula depopulation um, caused by a dose of radiation by regenerating. So again, just damage from radiation causes cells and tissues to start dividing again to fix that damage, to kind of repopulate those areas. This is called regeneration. In normal tissues, the time generation tends to vary between tissues. Tissues with very high turnover rates, those that are acutely responding, regenerate quite quickly, where late responding tissues have very little regeneration during fractionated radiation therapy because, of course, these tissues are non-dividing tissues. Human time allows regeneration of surviving cells from rapidly dividing tissues. So the longer that we protract the dose, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, this allows more time in between for the surviving cells to repopulate. Regeneration occurs in tumor cells and, again, in acutely responding tissues. Of course, we don't want regeneration in tumor cells, but we do want it in acutely responding tissues. So this particular R, you know, plays again both the tumor um, activity as well as acutely responding tissues, as did the first R. Right? Reoxygenation, we said, was really the only one of the four R's in which um, only the tumor specific 
Although regeneration of surviving tumor cells is undesirable, regeneration or repopulation of normal tissue for normal tissue tolerance should not be exceeded. Right? Some stem cells and some divided cells need to be left behind in these healthy tissue compartments in order for regeneration to happen. The last of the four R's is repair. Um, and this is, again, for radiotherapy, a, a very big uh, one of the four R's. Um, this is not the repair that we talked about earlier um, in regards to healing by fibrosis, by non-cell type. Um, this is a different type of repair. This refers strictly to the cellular repair of radiation damage seen through sublethal damage repair and potentially lethal damage repair. Um, our fraction sizes, again, the 180 a day, the 200 a day, the 240 a day, um, are considered sublethal amounts of radiation. Um, and repair um, needs to happen during the 24 hours that the patient is not away for a healthy cell to survive this type of dose of radiation. It plays the biggest role that we see um, in these sparing effects of fractionation. Um, it happens to occur in both categories of normal tissues, and that's an important one. So this is kind of the first R and the only R that really um, goes looking at late responding tissues as well. And this is a very important R for those because late responding tissues don't have stem cell compartments. So they don't have the ability themselves after doses of radiation. So if we're keeping our doses sublethal each day, both acutely and late responding tissue ability to repair this damage. Of course, again, if the healthy tissues are able to repair the damage, so are tumor cells as well. So looking at the last couple of questions here, this is the only R that selectively increases tumor cell kill. Reoxygenation. So this is the only R selectively um, increases tumor cell kill. Again, tumors are the only um, things in the body that have oxygen differentiation between you know cells that are farther away from the vessels versus those that are closest. So this particular R um, selectively increases tumor cell kill. As we said, there probably would not be any tumor cure without this particular R itself. Question six plays the biggest role in the sparing effect seen in fractionation. So the answer here is repair, repair of sublethal damage. Um, so again, this is related to the fraction size per day. And this is probably, this is why we don't um, see fraction sizes getting really large. Um, you know, that was attempted early on in, in, the, in radiation therapy, um, but they became lethal doses of radiation, in which case the healthy cells were unable to repair that damage. So the 180 to 200 to 240 a day, um, is really sublethal and it allows for healthy cell repair. And it is what we see for as far as sparing effect um, of fractionation. So 
So again, these four R's, repair, redistribution, regeneration, and reoxygenation, are all kind of interplayed at the same time each day that we treat cancer patients using radiation therapy. Okay, and it looks like here we have, um, I have plenty of questions to go over, and um, it might be a good time to do that. I will see if Christina is there. I'll turn off my microphone for a second. All right, thank you so much, Jerry, and thank you all for being here on the webinar. We're going to take just a moment to go over the Q&A, and we have a couple great questions, one from Stephanie. Would you say that the terms reassortment and redistribution are interchangeable? Um, so I'm, I'm somewhat unfamiliar with the terminology reassortment. I've only ever heard it um, used as redistribution. Um, I mean, looking at them, they very much could be the same, you know, as long as we're talking about, um, you know, the cell cycle, G1, S, G2, and M, um, and we're talking about, again, the process of cells over the 24 hours in between treatments redistributing themselves throughout the cell cycle. Reassortment sounds like a terminology that would certainly be okay with that. Um, when I used Travis and Hall, which are my two resources for um, a lot of this, um, the term redistribution was often used, so it could be, but it's not something that I'm familiar with. Okay, thank you, Jerry. We have one other question here. Maybe you can quickly go over it. Um, can you define OER again, briefly? Sure, OER is oxygen enhancement ratio. It's really kind of looking at how much more effective um, is radiation in the presence of oxygen aerated versus um, in a hypoxic state? And so what you're kind of looking at here is, you know, is there some effect, you know, some sensitizing effects seen with oxygen? And when you compare the two, kind of, you look at two cell populations, a hypoxic one, you give them a certain dose of radiation and an aerated group of cells, and you give them a certain de uh, dose of radiation, you know, what is the outcome? And in the presence of oxygen, um, we see much larger amounts of cell kill because of more free radical formation. Um, so the oxygen enhancement ratio tells us that oxygen enhances the effects of radiation. And again, the, the guiding numbers there are probably two to three times more sensitive than a grouping of cells that are in a hypoxic state. So the oxygen enhancement ratio tends to be given as about 2.5 somewhere between two and three, um, as to how much more sensitive cells are um, in the presence of oxygen. And that's a really huge thing for tumor radiobiology, where you really end up having these groups of cells that are, some are oxygenated and some are hypoxic. Um, and really, really the difference in doses that would be necessary in order to, to treat those. Luckily though, with reoxygenation, it's taken care of just by fractionation allowing oxygen to diffuse out to those hypoxic cells, making them more sensitive. So it's really an enhancement ratio. All right, great. Thank you for answering that. We have just a couple more questions here. Somebody asked um, if you could please repeat shouldered survival curves. Okay, so shouldered survival curves, um, are associated really with more complex cells. So human cells, mammal cells. And really, you know, if you look at, if you irradiated kind of a petri dish of bacteria cells, very simple cells, you wouldn't have a shoulder curve. You'd have a straight line, essentially meaning that as you increase dose, you see a linear reduction in cell survival. Those cells tend not to be able to repair radiation damage. But mammal cells are a little bit more complex. So in the low dose region, meaning at the lower doses, we end up not having a straight line portion. We have a shoulder, which is that curved part, the part that's the arc. And kind of in that low dose region, you know, human cells or mammal cells tend to be able to repair that low dose of radiation. It really works close to background radiation, so we know that to be true. So in the, the lowest dose region, human cells tend to be able to repair damage. Now, as the dose escalates and you get to the straight line portion, that D sub zero, at that point, dose is accumulated enough where many of the targets that need to be damaged have been, and as you increase the dose, you start to see a linear increase kind of in cell kill. 
Um, but again, we have that low dose region, that shoulder part associated with human cells, meaning that we really can and do repair low dose radiation pretty well. Um, and we require kind of this cumulative effect to get to the straight line portion. Um, and again, the broader the shoulder, the better the ability to repair. And broader shoulders are associated with cells that move through the cell cycle a little bit slower, giving them more time to fix the damage. You know, rapidly dividing cells, such as stem cells and the bone marrow, would have a smaller shoulder. And why do they have a smaller shoulder? Not because they're inherently more sensitive, it's because they don't have the time to fix the damage. They move through the cell cycle so quickly that they express their damage during M phase and they don't have time to fix it. So the width of the shoulder is often related to type of cell, you know, rapidly dividing versus non-dividing. The more time we give them, the larger the shoulder, the better their ability to repair damage, especially at the low dose region. Okay, we have our last question here from Kathleen. In the literature, the meaning of N extrapolation number seems confusing to me. Do you think you could clarify that a little bit? All right, so the, the N number is, it's a really, it's a theoretical number, um, meaning that, that when you look at more complex cells, especially those associated um, with humans, is that there tends to be there tends to be multiple targets that need to be damaged in order for the cell to, to die. And what they're saying is really radiation damage has to accumulate um, in order for more complex cells to die from a given dose of radiation. So the N number is in the extrapolation number is, is they kind of look at the terminal portion of the curve, they extrapolate that back to the y-axis, and it always falls between 2 and 10, meaning that multiple targets probably need to be damaged, like um, single strand breaks need to build up, you know, mutations need to happen in proteins that are specific to that cell. I mean, not every mutation is going to cause a cell to die. Um, and again, it's an in-theory number because we already know that a single X-ray interaction may be Probability-wise, even though it's low, maybe in the right spot in the DNA, not even creating a free radical where the cell dies. So it could be a single interaction, but in most cases, you kind of multiple interactions over time to accumulate. Um, so it, it really what it's trying to show us is that human cells tend to repair damage um, or have the ability to repair damage from X-ray um, and gamma rays pretty well. We really have to accumulate damage in order for it to be seen. Um, and then those targets, again, generally are plasma membrane, nuclear membrane, um, DNA, genes, chromosomes, and this has to build up. Um, there tends to have to be multiple interactions for that. Okay, thank you so much for presenting this webinar, Jerry, and thank you all for joining us for this free event hosted by We Passed. We wanted to share some great news with everyone. This webinar recording will be available to all WePass.com registered users, no subscription necessary, through the end of 2017. You can also access the recording via the We Passed YouTube channel, and don't worry, we will email you the link. And for up-to-date information about upcoming webinars, be sure to follow We Pass on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. All right, everyone, thanks again, and we'll see you next time.